to borrow a comment from our next speaker, I think Mr. Justice O'Leary demonstrated why he's a man who requires no introduction. Our next speaker is Honourable Judge Borns. It's topic to rest. a different pair of glasses. Thanks, uh, Brian. What I'm about to do is probably something that I should not do, and that is to discard the judicial hat for the next half hour and resume the old law teacher's hat, because I'm afraid that I cannot really dwell upon this topic uh, and discuss it as I feel it should be discussed without being very critical of certain judgments of courts, uh, which we all revere, particularly myself, because they're higher than I am. The subject is the defense of duress. It's properly called compulsion. That's what the criminal code calls it. But because the program has called it duress, I will call it duress for the balance of the afternoon. May I say that it has long been recognized by the common law as excusing criminal liability. However, in Canada, as I will attempt to demonstrate, the defense of duress has developed in a rather anomalous fashion. On the one hand, there is the statutory defense provided by Section 17 of the Criminal Code, which is limited in its application to certain offenses under certain conditions, and which in any event is available only to the actual perpetrator of the offense. On the other hand, the common law of defense of duress is preserved by Section 7, subsection 3 of the Code for those who are not actual perpetrators of an offense, but who are parties to its commission by virtue of Section 21, subsection 1 and 2, including the offenses which are accepted from the application of Section 17, with the exception of rape. Regardless of how one may choose to commit that offense, the defense of duress is not available. How this rather perplexing situation came to pass and the availability of the statutory defense and the common law defense of duress will form the basis of the discussion. If it sounds confusing now, wait another 15 minutes and see how confusing it really gets. To deal with some of the general principles first, the presence of duress during the act renders conduct otherwise criminal, not blameworthy. And what is perhaps the leading common law case on the subject, DT DPP for Northern Ireland and Lynch, a decision of the House of Lords five or six years ago, it was held that duress's defense on its own and does not negative either the doing of the act charged or the mens rea. The accused intends to do an act which, but for the duress, would be an actus reus. However, as Lord Morris stated in the Lynch case, the act of the accused may be done unwillingly, but yet intentionally. When one pleads duress, one admits the doing of the act, but denies that it is a crime. It's rather like the defense that you sometimes encounter in civil actions, the defense of confession and avoidance. The defendant, for example, admits breaching the contract, but pleads that the plaintiff was in fundamental breach and therefore is not entitled to recovery. The defense of duress is the same thing. The accused admits doing the act, but denies 
that it is a crime because of duress or compulsion. He had a choice and chose to commit the act rather than to submit to the threat. Thus, although the act was done voluntarily and intentionally, it is excused and the sanction of the criminal law is not imposed. Professor Glanville Williams, in one of his texts on criminal law, explains the reasons for allowing the defense. He says, most persuasively, it is allowed where the evil of breaking the letter of the law is less than the evil that was illegally threatened against the accused. From a social point of view, the accused may have done the best thing in acting to avert this evil. Whether or not it was socially better that the letter of the law should be violated, there are limits to the efficacy of the threat of punishment in controlling conduct. If the accused was enthralled to some power that could do him more harm than the legal sanction, the legal sanction must be ineffective and therefore should be removed. In the case of A.G. versus Whalen, which is an Irish decision, the court said threats of immediate death or serious personal violence so great as to overbear the ordinary powers of human resistance should be accepted as a justification for acts which would otherwise be criminal. Both in England and the United States, the position remains totally as at common law, and duress is available to a charge of any crime except murder. Although the English criminal law commissioners of 1833 approved duress as a defense to all crime except treason and homicide, the defense has never been committed to statutory form in that country. Canada adopted the more modified expression of the defense contained in section 23 of the English draft code of 1879, which presumably as a matter of policy limited the availability of the defense to certain crimes and under certain circumstances. And section 17 of the code remains virtually unchanged to this date since its incorporation into the original criminal code in 1892. And I'll read the section to you and then deal with the various elements that appear to comprise the defense. A person who commits an offense under compulsion by threats of immediate death or grievous bodily harm from a person who is present when the offense is committed is excused for committing the offense if, if he believes that the threats will be carried out and if he is not a party to a conspiracy or association whereby he is subject to compulsion but the section does not apply where the offense that is committed is high treason or treason, murder, piracy, attempted murder, assisting in rape, forcible abduction, robbery, causing bodily harm, or arson, all of which I'm sure you'll agree are among the more serious variety of crimes. Let's deal then with the various elements that comprise the defense. First, that the threat to the accused must be of immediate death or grievous bodily harm. One of the very few Canadian cases that has dealt with Section 17 is that of Regina versus Carker, a 1967 decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. In that case, the accused was charged with willfully damaging government property after smashing the toilet fixture in his cell during a prison riot. Probably not worth bothering with, but it set back the whole defense of um, duress because of the decision that I'll discuss in a moment. Mr. Carker was locked in his cell, and he was threatened by other prisoners who were all locked in their cells and they were shouting that if he did not join in the disturbance and break his toilet, then he would get, to quote from the case, he would get kicked in the head, his arm would be broken, and he would get a knife in the back, the 
first opportunity, although I'm not sure those words were used. The, <laughs> the trial judge had refused to admit any evidence of the threats on the ground that the evidence did not disclose a defense or excuse available at law. The Supreme Court of Canada agreed. Mr. Justice Ritchie, who wrote the decision on behalf of the unanimous court, said, but although the threats were immediate, in the sense that they were continuous until the time that the offense was committed, they were not threats of immediate death or immediate grievous bodily harm, and none of the persons who delivered them was present in the cell with the respondent when the offense was committed. So there was no present means of carrying out the threats. And Mr. Justice Ritchie held the trial judge was correct in not permitting evidence to go forward with respect to that. The decision of Kark and Carker was applied by the trial judge in Regina and Falkenberg, a decision of the county court in York, which was reversed on other grounds than this one by the Court of Appeal. In that case, and the Court of Appeal said nothing with respect to duress. In that case, the accused was charged with perjury. He'd given allegedly perjured te testimony at a preliminary hearing. And the reason he gave for giving the false testimony was because of certain threats made against him by three particular people, one of whom had made the threat prior to the preliminary hearing, and the other two were apparently in or about the courtroom at the time that Mr. Falkenberg was testifying. In rejecting the defense, Judge Lyon stated, uh, I am satisfied that by no stretch of the imagination can the accused testimony support this defense in the sense that whatever threats there may have been were not of immediate death or grievous bodily harm from a person who was present when the offense was committed. He went on to say it seems clear that the rationale behind the section is to provide a defense where there are such threats under circumstances that an accused person honestly believes that he has no other alternative but to commit the offense or suffer immediate death or grievous bodily harm without the opportunity of relief from such a proposed attack. This type of situation would be apparent where a person perhaps were at knife point and so on. Then he goes on to say, in the present case, once again, putting the accused evidence at its highest, there was no such threat of immediate death or grievous bodily harm. And then there's a passage with which I respectfully take issue. I'll explain why later. He said, the accused indeed was in the court itself when the offense was committed, and he had every opportunity to appeal to official help for protection if indeed such were necessary. Well, I'm not quite sure what I would do in circumstances such as that if the accused said there was somebody pointing a gun at him, help me. But uh, in any event, it was felt important by the trial judge in the Falkenberg case that the accused, to use different language, should have retreated or sought help in the circumstances. From the Carker case, I would submit it as clear that threats only of the most imminent danger will constitute duress within the meaning of Section 17. And even if such a threat is imminent, the Falkenberg decision suggests that if the accused could reasonably be expected to retreat from the threat, such as seeking the help of the police or the judge, the defense is not available. It is, I believe, clear from the decision in Carker that the Supreme Court has insisted on a most restrictive interpretation of Section 17 and has refused to consider the common law origin of duress. And indeed, this was expressly stated by Mr. Justice Ritchie in the following passage, which I would ask you to remember because I return to it later. Mr. Justice Ritchie said, I agree with the learned trial judge and with McLean J.A. in the Court of Appeal that in respect of proceedings for an offense under the criminal code, the common law rules and principles respecting duress 
as an excuse or defense have been codified and exhaustively defined in Section 17. Of the Supreme Court was of the opinion in Carker that the common law defense had been codified and exhaustively defined in Section 17. While threats to property are not sufficient under the language of Section 17 to raise the defense, it has not as yet been determined whether threats of death or grievous bodily harm to somebody other than the accused, such as members of his family, for example, in a hostage-taking situation, would come within Section 17. The section, of course, does not specifically state to whom the threats must be made. Let's move on then to the second element of the defense, and that is that the defense is available only if made by a person who is present when the offense is committed. Thus, the person who issued the threat must actually be present during the commission of the offense by the accused. That was part of the problem in the Carker case. Even if the threats had qualified as immediate in the Carker case, the defense would not have been available as none of the persons who delivered them was present in the cell with the respondent when the offense was committed. Then we come to the third element. For the defense to apply, the accused must be of the belief that the threats will be carried out. Thus, the section creates a subjective test with respect to whether or not death or grievous bodily harm will follow if the accused does not comply. So it is the belief of the accused which is paramount and not, for example, what a reasonable person would do in the circumstances. In this regard, I return to the obiter dictum in the Falkenberg case and suggest that it, appear, it would appear to impose an obligation on the accused to retreat from the threat or seek assistance in order to utilize the defense. That requirement, it would seem, has been imported from the common law, as indeed there is a line of authority in the common law jurisdictions which state that the accused, if he is threatened, must make every effort to escape. But it is not within the language of Section 17 and to import it would seem to be contrary to the subjective test, which is clearly created by that section. The fourth element is this. The defense will apply only if the accused is not a party to a conspiracy or association whereby he is subject to compulsion. The intent of this provision is to prevent an accused who participates in unlawful associations or conspiracies from relying on the defense. No Canadian court has yet interpreted this provision, nor indeed is there any authority in English law on the point. However, in the recent decision of the Court of, a, of Criminal Appeal in Northern Ireland in Regina and Fitzpatrick, it was held that duress was no defense to a charge of robbery which was committed as a result of threats by the RIA because the accused had voluntarily joined that organization. Interestingly, the court found that Section 17 of our criminal code, as well as similar provisions and penal codes in New Zealand, Australia, and elsewhere, to be persuasive evidence of the common law the comments of Lord Chief Justice Lowry, I think, are helpful in interpreting the language in Section 17. He said a practical consideration is that if some such limit on the defendant's duress does not exist, it would be only too easy for every member of an unlawful conspiracy and for every member of a gang except the leader to obtain an immunity denied to ordinary citizens. Indeed, the better organized the conspiracy and the more brutal its internal discipline, the surer would be the defense of duress for its members. 
can hardly be supposed that the common law tolerates such an absurdity. Then we come to the fifth element, the element that exempts certain offenses from the operation of the section. High treason or treason, murder, piracy, attempted murder, assisting in rape, forcible abduction, robbery, causing bodily harm, or arson. Anyone charged with such an offense as the actual perpetrator, as contrasted with the Section 21 party, cannot raise duress as a defense. As I suggested earlier, this is a policy decision to exclude from the operation of the defense certain offenses which are considered too serious to be included. However, as the attempted commission of an offense is by Section 24, a distinct offense, all such offenses, with the exception of attempted murder, which is found within the language of 17, are susceptible to the defense of duress. The Supreme Court of Canada this year had to interpret the phrase assisting in rape in the case of Bergstrom. There the accused, of course, was charged with rape. He admitted the acts of intercourse against the victim's will and without her consent and relied on the defense of compulsion under Section 17. The issue to be decided was whether the defense of compulsion applied to the crime of rape or whether it was excluded by the wording of the section, which says, of course, assisting in rape. Counsel for the accused submitted that as the offense was described as assisting in rape, and as there is no such offense described in that language in the criminal code, then the words of Section 17 are of no significance and should be ignored, and accordingly, rape then would not be one of the accepted offenses. Crown, on the other hand, contended that the words included rape, and that as a result, rape was an accepted offense and the defense of compulsion could not apply. Mr. Justice McIntyre, on behalf of the unanimous court, concluded that the phrase assisting in rape, if not in full and common usage in England in the late 19th century, was nevertheless an expression well known to the law at the time of the English Draft Code of 1879 and the enactment of Canada's first criminal code. He went on to add, there can be no doubt in my mind that by including a reference to rape in Section 17 of the Code, the parliamentary intent was to exclude it from the defense. The use of the words assisting in rape were designed to broaden rather than to restrict the exclusion and to bring into the exclusion from the defense those whose liability depended upon assisting in the commission of rape as well as the rapers in fact. There is no doubt that the language used to describe the accepted offenses in Section 17 might have been chosen with more care. And after uh, almost 90 years, particularly with the experience of the Bergstrom case, one hopes perhaps that Parliament might uh, clear up the language and use less archaic terms and use language that conforms with the way in which the accepted offenses are described in the code. It's not unreasonable to anticipate difficulty if this isn't done in the interpretation of other of the accepted offenses. One of them is forcible abduction. It's described as that, and that may or may not encompass some or all of the offenses in sections 247 to 250 of the code. Uh, I think the one even more likely to cause difficulty in interpretation is the expression causing bodily harm. I found at least nine sections of the code which refer to offenses involving the causing of some form of bodily harm. And the question is going to arise someday whether or not one of those sections is accepted from the duress defense. Now we come to the sixth element and that is the statutory defense of duress created by Section 17 is available only to the actual perpetrator of the offense, except, of course, with respect to the excluded offenses. However, those charged with the commission of any offense, including the accepted offenses other than rape, 
not as the actual perpetrator, but as one who aided or abetted its commission, or as one who was a participant in the carrying out of an unlawful purpose as a result of which an offense was committed, are entitled to rely on the common law defense of duress by virtue of section 7 sub 3 of the code. And this was the anomalous result of the Supreme Court of Canada decision in the case of Paquette decided in 1976. With respect, the judgment in Paquette is both difficult to understand and difficult to reconcile with the two other Supreme Court decisions, Carker and Bergstrom. Mr. Paquette had been forced under threats of death to drive two other persons to a store in order that those two, to his knowledge, could commit a robbery. After the robbery, he tried to frustrate the escape of those who had forced him to drive the vehicle. A bystander was killed during the robbery, and Paquette was charged with murder by virtue of Section 21, subsection 2. His defense of duress was successful, and he was acquitted. An appeal by the Crown was successful on the authority of the Dunbar case, a 1936 decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, which in essence said that the defense wasn't available in those circumstances. As a result, uh, Paquette appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, in which court the Crown relied upon the statement of Mr. Justice Ritchie in the Carker case that I quoted a moment ago, in which he stated that the common law rules and principles with respect to duress had been codified and exhaustively defined in section 17. This argument was rejected by Mr. Justice Martland, who delivered the judgment of the unanimous court, many of whom had been on the court when it decided the Carker case, including Mr. Justice Martland. After holding that Section 17 is limited to cases in which the person seeking to rely upon it has himself committed an offense, he went on to say, the section uses the specific words, a person who commits an offense. It does not use the words, a person who is a party to an offense. This is significant in the light of the wording of Section 21.1, which in Paragraph A makes a person a party to an offense who actually commits it. Paragraphs B and C deal with the person who aids or abets a person committing the offense. In my opinion, Section 17 codifies the law as to duress as an excuse for the actual commission of a crime, but it does not by its terms go beyond that. R versus Carker, in which reference was made to Section 17, having codified the defense or excuse of duress, dealt with a situation in which the accused had actually committed the offense. And so since Section 17 was not applicable because the accused was charged pursuant to Section 21, Mr. Justice Martland concluded that he was entitled to rely upon the common law defense of duress by section seven, subsection three. He went on to discuss the decision in the Lynch case, where as I mentioned earlier, the House of Lords allowed the defense of duress to a person charged with murder as a principle in the second degree, and he held that the common law defense should clearly be available to one charged by virtue of section 21, subsection two. In the result, the Dunbar case was overruled and Mr. Paquette was free to walk again. As I have stated more than once, the Supreme Court unanimously held in Carker that Section 17 was exhaustive of the defense of duress in Canada and that the defense must stand or fall on Section 17. The greatest respect, the conclusion that the common law defense of duress is available to one who is charged with murder as a party pursuant to section 21, subsection 2, to quote Professor Mewitt, is simply inconsistent with Carker. If anybody wants to read a very good analysis of that, I'll leave it uh, to you to 
look up the appropriate reference in the criminal law quarterly. As well, it is difficult to understand the literal interpretation given to the words, a person who commits an offense, which commences section 17. At one time, as we know, aiding or abetting the commission of an offense constituted a discrete offense itself. However, this was clarified by the present section 21, which provides that everyone is a party to an offense who commits it as the actual perpetrator, as an aider or abetter, and so forth. The interpretation given to the opening words of Section 17 would seem to be inconsistent with the remedial purpose of the reenactment of Section 21. And also, the interpretation seems inconsistent with the view of the Supreme Court of Canada in another case, that of Harder, in 1956, where the court reviewed the authorities covering the relationship of principles in the first and second degrees, particularly in reference to rape, and concluded that the law recognizes no difference in criminal culpability and liability between the rapist or raper and the assister in rape. So that in this regard, the decision in Paquette may be seen to be inconsistent with that in the Bergstrom case. Whatever may be the criticisms, however, of Paquette, it has been applied and depending upon its true interpretation, perhaps expanded in a number of recent cases. Indeed, based upon the recent authorities, I feel it is accurate to conclude that Section 17 is available as a defense only to the actual perpetrator of an offense to which the section applies, while the common law defense of duress is available to those charged with any offense including the accepted ones, but excluding rape, as a party to its commission by virtue of the aiding and abetting provisions of Section 21.1, as well as Section 21.2. Only a person charged with rape, either as the actual perpetrator or as a party, does not have the defense available, either statutorily or at common law. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't refer to the series of recent cases, uh, all appellate court decisions except for Morrison and McQueen, the most recent case, um, which, just to quote at random, the line taken from the judgment of Mr. Justice Moyer in one of the Alberta cases, uh, referring to Paquette, he stated, Martlin J. makes it clear that Section 17 is not a bar to a defense of duress in a murder charge if the defendant is charged only with aiding and abetting. In the Regina versus Morrison and McQueen case, the accused was charged with robbery as one who aided the commission of the offense. And the case is interesting because it's the only case that I have found in Canada which explains in some detail what indeed is the common law of duress. Since the common law defense of duress is available in all cases where a person is charged with a party to an offense, it becomes necessary, of course, to examine the nature of the defense of common law. I covered it in the paper, and I understand that you will be receiving copies of the paper, so I will omit that now, except to make the general comment that the common law defense in its nature is far broader than that created by Section 17. It doesn't have as many restrictions. So that um, there really are two discrete defenses of duress, in my view, available depending on whether one is charged as the perpetrator or as a party to the offense. And so perhaps it comes as no surprise to you that the decision in Paquette has the potential of creating substantial confusion, particularly in jury trials. For an accused who raises the defense of duress pursuant to Section 17, one test will necessarily apply. 
For the accused who must raise the common law defense, a different test will apply. Suppose that we have a defendant who's charged with robbery, an offense which is excluded from the operation of Section 17. On one view of the evidence, the defendant may be guilty as the perpetrator of the offense. On another view of the evidence, as an aider or a better. And as we know, the distinction between joint perpetrators and an aider and a better may be frequently very difficult to draw. In the first instance, duress is not available as a defense at all. In the second, it is. And the jury will have to be instructed that if it finds that the accused was the perpetrator of the robbery, the defense of duress is not to be considered. But if they find that he merely aided the commission of the robbery, then they must consider the defense. The defense, yes. I think greater difficulties would be presented in the following situation. Suppose D is charged with theft of an automobile, an offense to which the defense of duress is available under Section 17. On one view of the evidence, D may be guilty as the perpetrator, on another as an aider or a better. In that situation, the jury will have to be instructed with respect to both the statutory and common law of duress and the potential for confusion will escalate when one contemplates the possibility of the need to instruct the jury on the application of section 21, subsection 2 as an alternative theory of guilt, and we perhaps throw in section 212 and a few other sections of the criminal code. Finally, let me talk about the burden that rests upon the defense and the crown where duress becomes an issue. With respect to the defense of duress, there is an evidential burden upon the accused to raise the defense, while the ultimate burden of negativing the defense rests with the prosecution. The proposition stated by Mr. Justice Edmund Davies in the English case of Gill has been adopted in Canada. And there he stated, in our judgment, the law in this matter is to be found correctly stated in Glanville Williams' criminal law in this way. Although it is convenient to call duress a defense, this does not mean that the ultimate persuasive burden of proving it is on the accused, but the accused must raise the defense by sufficient evidence to go to the jury. In other words, the evidential burden is on him. The Crown are not called on to anticipate such a defense and destroy it in advance. The accused either by the cross-examination of the prosecution witnesses or by evidence called on his behalf or by a combination of the two must place before the court such material as makes duress a live issue fit and proper to be left to the jury. But once he has succeeded in doing this, it is then for the Crown to destroy that defense in such a manner as to leave in the jury's minds no reasonable doubt that the accused cannot be absolved on the grounds of the alleged compulsion. Therefore, once the issue of duress is properly before the jury, it must be instructed that before they can convict, they must be satisfied that the Crown has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused did not act under duress. And so the effect of the defendant interjecting the issue of duress is to impose upon the prosecution an additional element which would not otherwise be part of the Crown's case. What may, however, present a somewhat difficult question is the determination of whether or not the defense has met the evidential burden. If not, the prosecution, of course, need not be concerned with the, with disproving duress because the issue never gets before the jury. What is of importance, therefore, is what tests the defense must meet in order to place the issue before the jury. In this regard, the defense of duress must be distinguished from the true affirmative defense which allocates to the accused a burden of persuasion of more probably true than not true, the sanity defense of Mr. Justice O'Leary spoke about a few moments ago as an example. However, no persuasive burden rests upon the accused who raises a non-affirmative defense, such as duress or drunkenness. 
Yet as between the so-called defenses of duress and drunkenness, there is, in my view, a significant difference. With respect to drunkenness, it would seem, as Mr. Justice Spence said in Allward and Mooney, that the test is whether there is any evidence of intoxication. If so, the issue must be left with the jury, with the persuasive burden resting on the Crown to overcome that evidence and establish the capacity of the accused beyond a reasonable doubt. With respect to duress, however, the evidential burden requires the defense to meet a statutory definition of the defense, the five elements that we covered earlier, or the common law requirements if it isn't a Section 17 defense. If this can be analogized to the evidential burden which rests upon the Crown to present a prima facie case with respect to all of the elements of the offense, it would seem that the accused must meet an evidential burden with respect to all of the elements of the offense. Thus, in the view of Mr. Justice Ritchie, to return to the Carker case, this introduces an element of law for the evidence adduced by the defense must meet the legal definition of duress before the issue is properly interjected into the case as a matter fit to go to the jury. And you'll remember there that the Supreme Court of Canada said the trial judge was correct in his ruling that certain evidence was inadmissible because, in his view, it couldn't constitute duress. I don't think one can have any quarrel with the approach of Mr. Justice Ritchie as general proposition, namely that the defense must, the defense raised must meet the legal definition of the defense. However, with respect, I do take issue and question the appropriateness of preventing the defense from introducing evidence of duress on the ground that it apparently fails to meet the requirements of the Section 17 characterization of the defense. It would seem that the correct time to determine that issue is when all the evidence has been presented and the decision must then be made as a matter of law whether duress should be left with the jury. And this decision is made even more difficult when the case is one in which, depending on whatever view one takes of the evidence is either a statutory defense or a common law defense, which in my view highlights the danger of prematurely determining the entire question of the availability of the defense by a ruling as to the admissibility of evidence. To put the matter somewhat differently, since the authorities are clear that the evidential burden rests on the accused, I feel he should be given every opportunity to meet it and he should be permitted to introduce whatever evidence may be available to raise the defense of duress. It is then for the trial judge to determine at the conclusion of the evidence as a question of law whether the evidence of duress is sufficient to add an additional element to the case for the Crown and that the Crown must negative the effect of duress upon the accused. At this stage, it would seem that the trial judge must consider one or both of these two questions. First, the sufficiency of the evidence, i.e., has the evidential burden been met? And second, assuming the sufficiency of the evidence, does it meet the legal standard appropriate to either or both of the statutory or common law requirements of duress? This, of course, leaves unanswered the test to be applied to determine the sufficiency of the evidence, an issue that the Supreme Court of Canada did not have to consider in the Carker case. As I indicated earlier, the Allward Mooney case spoke of any, exp any evidence with respect to drunkenness. The well-known case of Papageon, both the majority and the minority positions in the Supreme Court of Canada adopted the test uh, in Kelsey versus 1953, I guess it was the Queen, Mr. Justice Dixon put it this way, if there was some evidence to convey a sense of reality to a defense of mistake as to consent, then the jury ought to have been instructed to consider that plea. In another English case, the recent case of Holmes, determining whether or not the issue of provocation should be left to the jury, the test was stated to be a view of the evidence most favorable to the accused. In the United States, the burden of producing evidence in order to raise such defenses as duress, entrapment, self-defense, 
has been variably described as evidence that fairly raises the issue, slight evidence, and some evidence, but more than a mere scintilla. The model penal code reflects the view that the accused must merely present evidence sufficient to raise a reasonable doubt. So it's difficult to determine the precise test to be applied to determine whether or not the evidential burden has been met. Perhaps any difference in the articulated standards in most cases will be without significance in view of the essential and exactness of any attempt to describe with precision the quantity or quality of evidence. And finally, a married woman who is threatened by her husband has the same defense of duress as that provided for in Section 17. There was a presumption at common law that a married woman committing an offense in the presence of her husband did so under compulsion. This presumption has been abolished by Section 18 of the Criminal Code, and no special circumstances apply to a married woman, and the defense of duress is available or unavailable to her, just as with anybody else. Thank you very much.